The region, which lies in the centre of the southern part of England, consists of a coastal basin surrounded by the chalk uplands from which the rivers drain southwards. The scarp slopes of the hills overlook the adjoining lowlands of Blackmoor, the Vale of Pusey, the London Basin and the Weald of Kent. The region has three distinct parts. First, as we've seen, the surrounding dry upland of chalk, which dips southwards. Secondly, a central area consisting mainly of tertiary sands. And finally, the low-lying coastlands, much indented and drowned by the sea. Let's look first of all at the chalklands. With steep scarps along their northern edge, they consist of rolling upland cut up by deep water-worn valleys. The thin topsoil is formed of clay mixed with pebbles of the underlying chalk. It's quite a rich soil and the farms are large and prosperous. Wire fences rather than hedges separate the fields for one of the main agricultural activities is the rearing of dairy cattle for milk. The cattle feed on pasture, silage, fodder crops and grain grown on the farm. A great deal of cereals are grown, chiefly barley. It is sold as a fattening food for beef producers. And as this warm, sunny upland produces grain of high quality, some is grown for seed. The rain that falls on this permeable land quickly soaks through into the chalk. Wind pumps, together with electric pumps, are used to bring up water for the cattle. In dry weather, some of it is used to irrigate the crops. In the Itchen Valley, this fresh spring water from the chalk is used to flood riverside beds in which watercress is grown. Watercress is an important local crop. One and a half million bunches are produced here every year for sale in London and the Midlands. At points in the chalkland where there are natural routeways cut by the rivers, the market town, Rochester, Salisbury and Winchester grew up. The fine cathedral at Winchester bears witness to the past importance and prosperity of this ancient city. Its busy streets were first laid out in the Middle Ages. Salisbury is another city with a magnificent cathedral. Its spire is the highest in England.
narrow streets nearby lead through ancient gateways to the main part of the city. Like Winchester and Dorchester, Salisbury is a centre for the surrounding chalk farmlands. And at its busy modern market, farm produce and livestock are bought and sold. Now we move south to the second part of the region, the central tertiary sands. This is a much less prosperous area. The new forest, which covers much of it, consists of large tracts of heath and woodland over which wild ponies roam, finding scanty pasture among the heather, bracken, broom and gorse. Some of this poor land has been made productive by the Forestry Commission. In dry summers, fire is an ever-present risk for these plantations of conifers. In sand and gravel pits, where the soil has been cut away, we can see clearly how poor and stony it is. However, the river valleys which cut through this sub-region are rich in alluvial soil, and here farming is worthwhile. Cattle are grazed on fodder crops, grass is cut for silage, and pigs are reared for bacon. Vegetables are intensively cultivated on this rich river valley land. There is a ready sale for them in the market towns to the north and in the seaside resorts and ports along the coast. The most important market gardening area of the tertiary sand sub-region is centred around Swanwick, to the east of Southampton. Here, in addition to vegetables, soft fruit is grown, especially strawberries. Some of the fruit is ripened especially early under glass and sent off to markets in London, the Midlands and Scotland, as well as to the large towns in the region. Much of the produce intended for consumption in the region is sold to wholesalers and retailers at local auctions. All of it, a wide variety of vegetables and fruit, was grown in the few areas of good soils found in the valleys and in the Swanwick district of this otherwise infertile area of the tertiary sand. The nature of the third sub-region, the coastland, can be seen best from the air. Parts of this sub-region, like the first, consist of chalk exposed by the sea in the form of cliffs. The line of chalk stacks called the Needles, at the western tip of the Isle of Wight, was produced by the further constant pounding of the waves along lines of weakness in the chalk. The cove at Lulworth was made by the sea cutting through a similar line of weakness in limestone cliffs. But in contrast, sea has built up parts of the coast. The long shingle bank called Chesil Beach was formed by material moved along eastwards by the waves.
first point, a hooked spit of sand and shingle, was gradually formed in a similar way. When the sea level rose at the end of the Ice Age, lower parts of those were drowned. Wide estuaries were thus formed, such as that of the Bewley River. The wide expanse of water leading to Pool Harbour, which provides a natural sheltered anchorage for yachtsmen, is another example of a drowned river estuary. Along this warm and sunny coast, with its many sandy beaches, seaside resorts developed. For instance, Weymouth, Bournemouth, and Shanklin on the Isle of Wight. The drowned river estuaries facing the English Channel provided natural harbours, such as Poole, Portsmouth, and Southampton. The seaside, for example, are very popular in the summertime, especially during the months of July and August. The largest holiday centre is Bournemouth, which has many hotels, long promenades, lifts on the cliffs, and other attractions for the holidaymaker. The climate at Bournemouth, mild even in the winter time, suits elderly folk, many of whom come to live here in retirement. Even subtropical trees grow in the fine public garden. Portsmouth is the largest naval harbour on the south coast. Beyond its narrow entrance lies a large stretch of sheltered deep water, giving anchorage for many vessels. There are facilities for shipbuilding, repairs and the servicing of the fleet. The largest liners afloat ply to and from Southampton docks, ten miles inland at the head of the long drowned estuary of the Test and Itchin rivers. They tie up at deep water keys and the turnaround of the ships is speedy because of the long period of high water each day. Southampton is the largest passenger port in the British Isles, serving America, Africa, Australia and New Zealand. Apart from passengers, some liners carry perishable cargoes, especially fruit, from the tropics and the southern hemisphere. The fruit is distributed all over the country from a market situated close to the docks. Other goods imported through Southampton include constructional material, such as timber, for use in the region. There is much less export trade, mainly cars and high-priced crated manufactured goods. As Southampton is an ocean terminal, it has excellent dry dock facilities for repairs.
At Fawley, at the southern end of Southampton Water, a large petroleum refinery has been built. It is supplied with crude oil brought from the Middle East and the Gulf of Maracaibo in large ocean-going tankers. The vast installations at Fawley cover three and a half thousand acres of infertile land. The refined products are stored in tanks to await distribution, mainly by coastal tanker, to installations along the southern and eastern coasts of the country. Southampton and the seaside resorts are served by the railway routes to London and the Midlands, which pass through the gap towns of Basingstoke and Newbury. Improvements in rail services and the development of the main roads which converge on the region from the west, north and east may enable Southampton to become an even larger port with associated industries and increased cargo traffic. A new centre for the growing population of southern England.